All right, we're going to talk about Zen Server. Where's the clock so I can keep the pace on time? Okay. okay. All right, and I have till. You have till about eight thirty. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll leave a little time for questions. So I'll finish up before then. <clears throat> so XCPNG Server. This is Zen Server, which a lot of people associate Zen Server with the folks over at Citrix. Uh, this is a fork and completely open source GPL uh, of this. So Zenverse is a virtualization system, supports para virtualization and hardware assistance full virtualization. Uh, it gets its name from the next generation virtualization initially created by the University of Cambridge uh, Laboratory under open source license. So this is where it all started with the Zen project. And as far as who uses it, so Amazon until November of 2017 was 100% based on the core of the Zen open source project and hypervisor that runs all of their EC2 instances. Uh, but they did change over their C5s, uh, new compute power ones, are uh, a special KVM uh, hypervisor called Nitro. Orion VM hosting is one of the other large ones, but Linode for a long time used Zen Server as core before they switched over to a KVM. Uh, there's a lot of companies still using uh, the Zen at its core. Now, Citrix was the most famous for taking the Zen Server project, and what they had done was you have the Zen project, and then Citrix Zen Server was basically a distro with the Zen Server core all packaged in together as a single product install that you could do. Now, it was really popular and had quite a long run, and it started to become really unpopular after 7.3, because and don't worry about reading all the text here, but I'll read the important part. Having carefully considered what features are in each edition, we've taken the decision to move some features out of the free edition and into standard. Now, it's even interesting about how Citrix did this. This is actually a Zen project blog post, not a Citrix product blog post. Mm -hmm. What they did was they released an update, so people went from 7.2 to 7.3. And what they done was they shuffled all these features, like uh, Zen Motion and the live features, out. So you just seen an update, you hit, oh, there's a new update, I'm gonna go load from 7.2 to 7.3, and then you're like, wait a minute, my features are all grayed out. Oh yeah, you gotta buy a license for this and gotta buy a license for that. And there's another licensee for this. Also, they substantially increased all their license fees at the same time. So Citrix kind of upset the community a lot by doing this because they had always been a good contributor back to the original open source part. They added some of their closed source modules within it, but you know it was still an overall happy relationship. You could get the free version and you could pay for support. Pretty simple business, but they changed everything around and they slid it through as an update and posted it on the Zen Project blog, not even their own blog. I actually got on Twitter and called the guy out for it and we went some banter back and forth. And um, this started a Kickstarter campaign by the people who run a project called Zen Orchestra, which we're gonna talk about later. And the Zen Orchestra people said, wow, we have this product that is a web interface that's really popular that sits on top of Zen Server. Well, if Zen Server becomes unpopular, we're kind of a one-trick pony. Our product becomes really unpopular, too. So they had kind of a monetary interest in starting up their own version. And they said, you know, what do we really need Citrix for anyway? So why don't we just do this ourselves? But we're going to need a few dollars to get this started. They had a goal of 6,000 euros. Uh, I think at the time it was like roughly $7,000 in the exact conversion. Um, before the Kickstarter ended, they hit 38,000 in donations to it because so many companies are using the product. So the Kickstarter went better than good for them and it actually overfunded the project. You don't hear that a lot in open source projects, but um, it was kind of interesting. It only took them, ah, man, a matter of just a couple months before they were able to get the entire project from funding till its first release in beta. Um, and they did some really cool things. Uh, on the installer, it completely will write over the top. Even if you installed 7.3 version with all the re license restrictions, it goes over the top of Citrix Zen Server in place, looks the same. The very first version they released would even let the Citrix tools work with it exactly the same. You didn't have to reload. Your storage repository is all there. It would, it's almost like it was a patch. And it just patched it back to being open source, essentially, is what they did. Um, but it was really cool, and a lot of people liked it right away because it came uh, a turnkey solution uh, where you could take your disabled Citrix box that you accidentally upgraded. By the way, there's not a regression path once you upgraded to migrate into it, uh, and drop this on top of it, and all your features came back alive, and all of your storage repositories and your VMs, everything was still there. Uh, so they've done a good job, and they still support migration from any of the seven versions of Citrix. Uh, swept over to their version and completely importing all the settings. So it's not like a reload, so it became very easy to transition. Now how is XCP different than Zen Server? 
This is how they were their packaging. This is from the developer. XCP is usable from the source, is very easy, and we are continuously improving the upgrade update process to make it even more turnkey. XCPG unlocks nearly all the features of Zen Server Commercial Edition for free. And one of the other things they've done, they're really big on the open source. So Citrix is still, because Citrix is at 7.6 and so is XCPG, they're still in parity for releases because they are downstream from the Zen Server project. Um, the one thing they do that's kind of interesting, so Citrix recently introduced, I think it's the GFS2 file system into there, but it has a series of closed source modules in there. They won't compile in everything anything, I should say, that's closed source. So it's been kind of neat to watch the project work. They're very community-oriented, very open source advocates, and if it's closed source, it doesn't, they, they for license conflicts, are very clear on this. Because people say, well, can't you include this or this, because uh, they're active in the forums. Like, sorry, that's uh, closed source. We know Citrus includes it, but it's not part of our stack. And they're very easy to talk to, and things like that. So here is the actual page for it, and <clears throat> it didn't take long at all. They do have over four, well, bigger now, but over 4,000 forum posts. 15,000 downloads, this project has like just gone up like fire form. It's been really great, especially because that whole in place thing. So it's been kind of a no brainer for people to go, oh, I can just switch everything over to this. <clears throat> now to compare to uh, Citrix, Zen Server, it's obviously really close to comparison, but they're looking into the bigger, broader market of the elephant in the room going after VMware ESXi. That is the default standard for a lot of enterprise environments. And it does have in parity with them. You have a web console that you can manage when you combine it with Zen Orchestra. You have uh, VM admin, live migration, live VDI migration, and high availability. So this supports clustering. This supports completely moving live VMs between clusters, between pools, uh, whether they're associated or not. So you can actually just come into a data center and drop in a whole new rack of it. And with no other association other than pointing them at each other, they can migrate them all, even across versions. Uh, of live migrations from Citrix to them or vice versa. It doesn't have any live migrations from uh, ESXi. A lot of people ask me about that because they want to change it over. And of course, with no licensing fees, uh, this makes it really attractive. Some of these data center places go, wow, it's all open source. Now, their business model is they sell support packages. And so if you want paid contract support for it, they absolutely have uh, regular fees and everything for that. Now, the product is an orchestra that runs on top of XCPNG is open source as well with the same business model, and it's been that way for a long, long time. Uh, they, they sell paid support, so you could always get the sources if you want, uh, compile it yourself, have all the source code available, or you can buy uh, support contracts from them prepackaged. Now also, uh, onto the larger enterprise features, uh, it does support hyperconvergence. Uh, they have vSAN in the e, uh, VMware. They have ExoSAN. Uh, tool updates, automated updates, thin provisioning, um, the standard console views. Matter of fact, one of the interesting things about the way XCPNG and Zen Server as a whole works is really amazing amounts of scripting can be done with it because you can control everything about the VM from the command line. So you can create them, move them, migrate them, uh, snapshot them, and you could create bash scripts or whatever your scripting language you want to completely take control over the VMs. Uh, and that's essentially what Zen Orchestra does. It just puts a pretty web interface to make your life a lot easier. Now, this is another really enhanced feature. So they uh, work with CoreOS. You can load Zen Server, load Zen Orchestra, load CoreOS, build your Docker images, and then orchestrate all of your Docker images as if they work like VMs. So you have all these container support. Now, I'm not an expert at actually deploying and using it, but it's a pretty slick system that's built in, so you can build a really large scale uh, Docker container. And then because the Docker container for us itself is a VM, all the VMs follow under it, so you can back it up and move it between all of them, so you still get all your um, VM features of having a virtualization system, along with all the Docker availability and high performance you get out of containers. And it does support, this is the web interface for uh, Zen there, the cloud and knit in Zen Orchestra. So if you are doing a massive deployment and you want to do cloud and knit where you drop in the SSH keys and then you know, string up 30, 40 VMs or Docker containers underneath. That can all be put in here through a web interface and then mass deployment. We'll cover that a little bit later too for VMs. <clears throat> now, how does Zen architecture works? So you have it, your hardware layer at the very bottom. Then in between the hardware layer, we have the Zen hypervisor itself. So it's a type one hypervisor and it loads right at boot. There's not like an operating system within this. It's all part of the boot. It integrates right into the grub uh, partition itself. 
then you have what they refer to as uh, domain zero, where it's mostly shortened to DOM zero. DOM zero is where everything lives for Zen, and it uses LVM when it sets up uh, for snapshots. It's actually so when you reload over the top, you can create more LVM snapshots to be able to quickly roll back if an update doesn't go well. But everything starts at DOM zero. Then from there, you can start pair virtualization guess or hardware virtualization guess. And if you're not familiar with the difference, full virtualization allows complete isolation. So the VMs in there can be of any type. They can be Windows, they can be BSD, it doesn't matter. Zen's running at the bottom and anything is, is completely emulated, the hardware top to bottom, so it doesn't really matter what OS works in there. Pair virtualization, and by the way, pair virtualization for Zen server has been available, I think, since the Linux kernel version 3. Um, it's been integrated in there, so it's been years of integration. So when you set up a pair virtualization with Zen, where it's going to have more interaction with the underlying layers, um, there's not anything special you really have to do to make any of that work. All the functionality is built right into the Linux kernel. Now, how the Zen server hosts are laid out. So, in a single piece, we have a one Zen server host that'll have either local storage or direct attached storage and ISO storage. ISO storage is the repository for all your ISOs. Um, local storage can be a RAID array attached to the machine physically, or in some cases, uh, some of these are set up in Blade servers or one use servers with no local storage at all other than some boot device in there. You can load it on a thumb drive or just on a, a small internal hard drive and it's eventually operated over like an iSCSI connector on a shared storage pool. And that would be your single Zen server host. Then you take Zen server hosts uh, two or more, three if you want high availability or more, up to 64, and you create a resource pool. And the resource pool with a shared storage device such as iSCSI then creates your high availability system where it can magically pass around all the VMs between each other and load balance and uh, failover so you can take them out, you can do rolling updates across your pools and it will automatically shift all the resources as needed between however large your pool is and it kind of acts as one physical server. Now even if you have a single Zen server host and another single Zen server host not in a pool, they can still absolutely talk to each other and pass live VMs between each other. So you don't, because a lot of the questions that have come up for me is, well we have a couple Zen servers not in a pool, we, keep, we treat them as independent individual things because of the testing I do. Um, in our office, they will work perfectly fine all the features. You just It's kind of cooler when they're in a resource pool because then you can uh, just administer one of them. Now the Zen Motion is pretty slick how this works as well. Uh, so you have source, destination, and parent snapshot active. So the way it works with the live VM is really slick. So when you first snapshot it to start the Zen Motion, I got it on this server and I want it over on this server, while it's live, it's going to create a snapshot in like a base of it. Then it's going to copy the base over and then create these other pairs on there. So while you're writing to the VMs, while it's running whatever services it's running, it's a mail server and all the mail is coming in and out of it, it keeps in parity both the C modules here at the same time until the VMs passed over. The VM will pass over at the speed of line level network and of course limitations to the storage and of course it will slow down again with that. But it will do complete live motion transfers and it's not, it's pretty simple when you look at how it does it from a back end when you watch it create the VHD files on there. And this is a look at so how some of the snapshots are done on here. I just took a couple screen grabs so easily you can snapshot the VMs. If you're not familiar with how virtualization works with snapshotting, um, every time I go to update something that, that's built on some uh, messy frameworks. It's nice because you can quickly snapshot it. It's a slice in time of exactly where that machine is. And then I do the update and then the update goes horribly wrong and I type something wrong. So then you can just quickly revert back to it. So all the snapshot features in here and I'm going to cover how some of those work later. Now it's also interesting the way it handles coalescing scenarios. And what these are, so when you do the snapshots and then you merge them back into each other because you delete them, it happens on the surface to you in real time. Matter of fact, you can actually create snapshots and then create snapshot of snapshot and then take that snapshot you created and spin up another VM off that fork and you can do all these and they happen in real time, but in the storage backend, it's actually creating a whole lot of virtual hard drives and once the load level settles down, they coalesce back together. And it's kind of neat to understand how it works. So I put a little bit of the slide in here, um, but because of this coalescing, it allows you to 
uh, give that real-time interface on the top while the storage backend is handling all this magic in the back. So it's just kind of a, I, I just find it fascinating when I started digging into a little bit how that worked. I won't spend too much time on it though. <coughs> now let's get to the install part of this. So how do you, how do you install it? So it's pretty straightforward. You grab the ISO, um, they got the standard DD or use Rufus or Etcher or whatever your favorite right to there is and create a bootable USB with this. They also have a net, net install um, option where it's a much smaller like stub installer that goes and downloads all the extras online. And then you have the web UI once, you're, once you have it loaded. Because by default, it doesn't have any interface at all. It's just a complete command line, even when you load the server. It just comes up and boots up to command line interface, and a lot of people go, well, now what? Well, the nice thing is, not that I recommend, but if for new novice users, it's a great way to do it. You can just curl the xoa.io.deploy, uh, and it's an auto-magical bash script that will run, it will go out. And once again, because it's all command line, it grabs the XVA file, um, which is the standard uh, Zen format file is very similar to an OVF file. Matter of fact, Zen uh, Server does support both OVF here, Open Virtualization Format uh, module. So if you export something out of another hypervisor to an OVF file, like even VirtualBox, you can import it in. The default it wants to handle is importing and exporting XBA files, <clears throat> and this just pulls down that file and instantly loads the module, configures it for you, and configures a VM to run Zen Orchestra. So this is what the install looks like. It's your standard Linux install. It's essentially based on uh, CentOS. I don't remember exactly which, more or less latest version, a uh, long-term support version. Now, something that they've done that Citrix stripped out for reasons unknown, other than Citrix tried to make it probably as lean as possible, Citrix removed things like RAID. So uh, when you build it on Citrix, if you don't have a hardware RAID and you just have a couple hard drives, it doesn't have a way to RAID them together. Uh, they said, that seems silly, MDAM and uh, RAID. Why don't we delete that in? So it only supports mirrors because you're setting up only the boot partition. So it only has a mirroring option when you set up the RAID, but easy enough to do, you just select them. Um, and if you want at the same time, you can build up your storage area, but you can always build that later. So this is just building the boot when you're doing the install. And you generally want to build the storage separate. Uh, standard networking options, it supports VLANs from the RIP and uh, automatic DCP or static. And once you're done, you're presented with this. Uh, this is all you see on the screen uh, once you get started. Now there are some power to doing this because you can set your management interface IP so it gives you uh, menu driven so you can do some of the basics to get connected to it or SSH into it, uh, set the password, reboot it, shut down, or configure um, some of those details. And when you list all the stuff on here, I just, uh, XE is the beginning tool set. So XE and then the commands, uh, this is the, some of the VM commands from uh, add, destroy, remove, shadow, all the stuff. So you can, if you take the time, and boy, the documentation is not wonderful, you can go through lots of tedious documents and control it from the command line, um, but that's kind of a pain in the butt to do. It also has uh, resource tools if you SSH in, like Zentop. So you do have the ability from the command line as well to dig into it, but it just gets really hard to read really, really quickly looking at the servers like this. So we're gonna get into the tool sets that they do give you for free uh, to actually manage this a lot, a lot better. So the two ways to manage this are gonna be either with Zen Center, which is a Windows-based program. They're working on getting it to work in Wine. They're working on porting it over to Linux. Um, the problem is the source code for it has long been uh, upstream from Citrix, so they took the Citrix source code for this, but it's all built on some frameworks that don't make it easy to recompile it for Linux. Uh, but it's this is a complete free tool to download and manage, but it's pretty powerful and pretty slick. So we'll cover this one first. So other than having to run in Windows, which is you know the one downside of it, um, you open up the Zen Center software. It's a free download from their website. Also, whenever you set up a Zen server, by default, it serves this on port 80. Uh, there's a little web page, so you type in an IP address, you'll get port 80, and they keep a copy on there for you to download and links to their site. So they got a real basic web server. So even if you didn't have outside access or easy access to it, it comes compiled in with it. I think it's only like a 100 meg download. It's not a very big program. Now, from the top, and I know it gets a little bit small here, um, you get to the view of the server in a much more easy to read, easier laid out format. So I clicked on the top server right there. Uh, you click add server, type in the IP address, the username, password, really straightforward. Um, all this is managed, by the way, over port 443. Uh, all the API calls and everything, it comes with a self-signed SSL cert. You can always change it out if you wanted to have a signed one, but uh, it gives you a warning, gives you a fingerprint for the cert. 
and it goes from there. <clears throat> so once it's on there, um, this is the general look at it, so you know the Zen server. Uh, we can look at the memory, and it shows all the memory of all the running VMs that I have in here. Um, it says how, it's just, uh, how the memory is distributed amongst them. One of the cool things is on there, because it does have all the tool sets, if you have them loaded with inside of uh, the hypervisor, you can dynamically change the memory uh, on any of these hypervisors. You can give it ranges of memory. It'll let you over-provision memory. So if the machines all have the drivers loaded so they're properly communicating with the Zen server, um, and they go, hey, I'm not using all this memory, it can reallocate all that memory back to the pool and then dynamically allocate it so you can over-provision, but maybe that works for you because in some of these large hosting environments and spending some time in a forum, some of these people have like 10,000 VMs running across the series of these servers running this product, so they are used to using it at this, um, I mean, I had four terabytes of RAM just in one pool. <laughs> that was like, this is pretty neat stuff, but so they're used to over-provisioning because not all those need it at all the same times. Um, it's also smart. It looks at the VM, and if you want to uh, dynamically do this, it'll say, hey, changing this minimum memory will cause this VM to reboot it. Do you want to continue? And it can uh, dynamically go, okay, I'm going to go send a restart signal to this VM, and it'll come back with the new memory settings. So this control panel actually is pretty slick for being able to change things, and then it automatically just with a confirmation, yeah, I'll, I'll restart these. Um, something else that I didn't really cover a lot, uh, but they did keep the Citrix V app. And Citrix touts V app is this really cool thing. It's and any, you can take, let's say you have a, um, a web server that relies on a database that relies on a mail server. You just take those three VMs together and you call them a V app. And what the V app does, because they're all dependent on each other, you tell them they all start together, they all stop together, and if they move, they all got to move together. So V apps are just ways to group together common used VMs because they're dependent on each other. And you can set the start order, for example, of them to make sure each one's up before there. Um, but that's also controlled through this. <coughs> You control your networking. Now there's two networking. One says networking, one says NICs. That's because you can create your physical layer versus your virtual layer of networking. So you can create lots of networks attached to a single NIC, uh, including VLANs and including, it's hard to read, but I have my Tom's LAN of Zen. Uh, that is a internal only network. It does support that, so you can have your own internal network. Now the reason I do this is when I want to test firewalls. I connect the firewall to the WAN side to an external port, I connect the internal side, the LAN side, or as many LANs as I want to create, to internal NICs, and then I run other servers, let's say a Windows server inside of there. Now there's no noise on the network line at this point because the only VMs, it's only internalized. Uh, it's also great for sandboxing and testing, or just when you're curious about what leaks out of a VPN because you're not subject to any other interference. You've got an isolated network you can create. And sometimes you want to create isolated networks because you want the VMs to talk to each other and maybe they're using an insecure protocol, easy enough to create a special network within there and those two VMs can then talk on whatever protocol they want to each other directly. Um, and I tested it, oh, you get 12 gigabit uh, on the servers I've tested between the VMs is how fast they talk to each other. Then comes the physical layer of the network where you can bond things together, you can um, connect each one, set the MTUs, and all the physical side of it over there. Also down here is the storage and management. So these are all the ones available to the VMs. These are the uh, storage and management networks. So you can create like a dedicated storage network. And uh, how we've got a lot of these deployed is usually a 10 gig switch and attached to a couple free NASs on some shared storage. And you can build that as a separate network in there. And you can see the console for each uh, VM you connect, you can see the console just like you do on the screen. Uh, so that's kind of convenient, gives you like that direct access on there. It's got all kinds of performance. Uh, you can drill down here through all the cores, see what's doing what, histories of all the VMs that have been restarted, uh, change it too long, uh, you know, to look over time how much power is being used. Uh, then I just ran some stress real quick so the lines would do some squiggles on there. Um, it gives you IOPS, zero put, and all these can be customized. You can customize right down to the VM or exactly how you want to see things or you just want certain processors. These are actually a whole series of customizable, I don't know what the limit is, but you can just keep scrolling down and keep creating different charts. That way you can look at things from different angles. Now when we st get down to the VM itself, it supports, um, it's kind of the same layout again, but it's just for an individual VM. You have the console, you have the memory, storage, networking, all the features on there. Um, and the console is self-aware, so it knows the IP address because I have the Zen tools loaded, and it says open SSH console, so it just kicks off. Because I'm in Windows, it's actually got PuTTY built in, so you kick it off and it opens up PuTTY right to that VM. Um, 
And if you have it on a Windows one, it's uh, if there's an Intuos all you can turn on remote desktop and it just opens up an RDP session directly to uh, that system. So from a management standpoint, you don't have to think about even what IP address. You just hit it, it just grabs it, opens it, and follows the settings. Also, I love this up too. Um, a lot of people ask about like the performance. This is this is one running at my office. I threw Crystal Disk on here. Um, over a 10 gig storage network with a bunch of older uh, free NASs that I have running. It's not, this is all just spinning disks and it's still able to get it. Read and write speed, close to um, like a Samsung Evo SSD, single SSD. So the performance that uh, you get out of Zen server in terms of hard drive, read, write performance if, uh, using non-attached, non-local storage is actually really fast. And this is the performance uh, look inside of like a single virtual machine. So you can see all the virtual machines when you're looking at the top of the hypervisor, you can dig into the details of the virtual machine and see which ones are like, all right, this is, I see a lot of processor usage and you can search only down which one's sucking up all the resources um, and start looking at things like disk performance, read and write. And it shows every drive that you've attached to it. <clears throat> now the snapshots are kind of cool. So I did this, and this actually will fork out as many times as, uh, well, as many times as you have space for when you're doing the snapshot, because each snapshot is then provisioned, and there are only differentials between the changes. So I started with the Debian 9, and I created a test snapshot, then I created a couple more snapshots, but then I went back to the test snap and said, fork it, another VM off of here. So if you're building and testing out a lot of scenarios, you can click on any one of these and revert to it, create a new VM from it, Export it as an XVA file because you want to just have it on your computer or you want to take it somewhere else. You can even live motion a snapshot to a completely other Zen server and that's where the coalescence comes in. You took a piece that's a slice of a snapshot to which is only a differential but then you want to pass that snapshot to a completely different server on a different repository. No problem. It reassembles all the pieces that you made and this is that coalescence I was talking about and brings it together and drops that snapshot as a complete running VM on whatever server you aimed it at or splits it off and runs it as a VM on this server. So the possibilities are endless when you're setting these up. So if you're doing a lot of testing scenarios like when you're building on a web server and you want to test the way something works in one scenario but you don't want to lose all the configuration, you can just keep forking it as many times as you want or as much time as you have space for it. Now when you start looking at it, so I changed from infrastructure view to object view. There's actually a whole series of organizational views, object views. So when you're managing these at scale, um, it lets you search, find, and sort all of these in all kinds of different methodologies to let you see them. So this tool is pretty neat uh, for managing a whole lot of Zen servers at once. And when you group things together in the resource pools, you can start ignoring even which server anything's on. You can just say, move things to the pools with the most resources and uh, change them up pretty easy. Or just look for an object and search for it because you know the name of the server you're looking for and you have a thousand of them and you want to find that one. And it'll break those down for you. <clears throat> now, how do you create a server on it? It's actually pretty simple. So one way is just to go file import. You can import an XBA file. Uh, for example, the Zen Orchestra works as a file. There's also a couple places out there that keep all, I can't remember the name, but there's a repository I found that has all these different created VMs um, that you can just download, like pre-set up for different things like Zabbix or whatever tool set you want to do. They import perfectly fine in here, so you can just grab one and import it. Or you can use the wizard to create a new VM. It's got a ton of templates in there for Linux, uh, Windows, or you can just generically choose um, they have some kind of generic templates in there, like just generic Linux 64-bit template, or I don't know if they have a generic Windows template. They have all the Windows versions listed, so I don't think you need one. Now, when you're setting up those repositories, the ISO repository can be just a standard SMB share, and then uh, you point it at that whole, you can just have an SMB share with like, you know, 20, 30 dis, uh, ISO files in there. And as you do it, it just scans them every time um, you pull this up, and you get all the ISOs in here. One of the ones I have in here is CloneZilla because uh, kind of comes back to how do I get things off of other hypervisors when there's not a direct import export or how do you get something from a virtual uh, hardware machine into a virtualized server. Really ends here. I boot CloneZilla up in uh, Zen server. I boot it um, on the server that I want to send it to and just boot CloneZilla and send it to the hard drive. Works over the network fine. Easy way to get things uh, moved over. Except for Windows. Windows is a a little less happy about it, you got to play with uh, some of the drivers on there. Now CPU and memory, um, I chose 24 
CPUs, and then you can choose the topology, 12 sockets, two cores per socket. You can have all those on there. A lot of that has less to do with performance and a whole lot to do with the way some things are licensed. If it's licensed per socket or per core, um, you can mess with that on the hypervisor <laughs> side to maybe get around licenses on some of those things. Uh, then you just type in how much memory you want. And that's the uh, different core socket options. Now, by default, you set your default storage repository, and that's where it wants to create the VMs, but you can, of course, in as many storage repositories as you have attached, you can create a VM on, uh, and put the drives across as many as you'd like there. Networking. When you're building the network setup, there's a checkbox under every network that says, do you want this to be like a default assigned? And what that does is anytime you create a VM, it just default assigns it. Um, that way, even though I have all those piles of network, I only have two that I want defaulted whenever I create a new VM. That way I don't have this remove, 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 because um, all those other ones are just kind of for my lab testing. So that makes it pretty simple to do. Now, all that's fun, like I said, the downside is you run in Windows. So now we're gonna cover some of the same things, but we're gonna cover Zen Orchestra, the web interface. This is my preferred way to manage this. And this is actually for people that are managing at scale. This is the way they really like to do it as well. Now, Zen Orchestra, comes in a couple flavors. So you can buy support with pricing and everything else from them. You can get the full uh, version though um, from source code, but they don't compile it for you. That is their little hang up. It's like, here's literally the, the source code. It runs with Node and Yarn. If you've ever put that together, it's less than fun. It's one of those things that I've certainly broke a few times because I'm just, I don't know. It seems like every time there's an update to Node.js, it just, there's things and there's a lot of changes. Um, if you get the support package from them, even their free version, they have an auto-updating free version, and it just has a few of the features, like some of the backup, advanced backup features grayed out. So it's real easy, you can get started with the free version, or someone did this, and yes, they updated it seven hours ago, because they update it all the time, every time there's a change to the way uh, Yarn and Node work. Uh, this is a great GitHub repository, I have a tutorial on YouTube how to do this. You can take and just install Zen Orchestra, the full version from all the source code with the GitHub. You just you just run it and it magically just builds it for you um, inside of a VM. So you build a standard Linux VM. I prefer uh, Debian, so I build a Debian VM. I go git uh, pull this, then you just run an install.sh. Uh, takes, depending on speed of your computer, 10 to 15 minutes to compile all the code together and magic, you have a complete working Zen Orchestra install. Uh, it just says no support at the bottom because you compiled it from source and they, they don't support, they just said you can't get free support from us, which is fair. They actually, they say that, but if you post any questions in a forum, the guys like reply within an hour. It's amazing. <laughs> I, they're, it's like, if their support's that good and like for free, I, I've, I know a lot of people that uh, love their paid support. These guys are really good at it. Um, once you go into Zen Orchestra, um, it provides you with a default admin and password and uh, you log into it and you go over to settings, you go to servers. And because everything just runs over 443, as long as you have access to 443 on those, you just type in the IP addresses, and there's a little thing that says accept unauthorized certificates. You check the little box, and you add as many Zen servers as you have into Zen Orchestra. Really straightforward to do. Then from there, this is the uh, running VM view. Um, this actually sometimes is a confusion. If you've just started with Zen Server, you're like, I hit VMs, there's nothing there, but I know I imported VMs. The default view is, for whatever reason, uh, only running ones. You have to hit the pull down to show like non-running ones. But this is where this starts going well beyond the power of that uh, Windows interface. You can do all kinds of filters. Uh, it's, it actually supports regex at the top too. So you can type in like power state running tag uh, lab or tag production, and then it will filter for them. So I just chose tag lab machines. And for any VM, there's a really simple tagging system that goes in there, and it can be done as you build the VMs, or it can be done by grouping them together and adding a tag to a bunch of them on there. And the tags play an important role as an orchestra. Um, you can see the tags in the Windows version as well, but it plays an important role because any of the uh, scripting that you want to do within here for like backup jobs, you can say, I want to um, start all my production servers or stop all my production or lab or when you're doing a backup, you can just say that as a tag. And as I build new VMs, I never have to modify my backup. I just, well, this is now in production. I add the tag to it. It gets part of my backups that run every Saturday. So this shows the ones that are uh, running, not running. Um, it is aware of Debian, in, uh, so it puts the Debian logo, it's aware of Red Hat, it's aware of, um, that. you can't see it, but it's a BSD logo, so it realizes that PFSense is a BSD, and yes, you can run PFSense on here, it does work. Um, along with, I've tried quite a few firewalls on here, so I do all my firewall testing, and pretty much all of them work really well. 
Um, other things you can do, so by doing that, I checked the little box up there, and you can grab groups of them at a time, and you can do things like migrate all of them based on a tag. So you can just grab something like all my production servers, you have to go over here now. And that's actually usually how we do our updates. If we want to uh, do it during business hours, we just grab all the production servers, shift them over to one of the two servers we have, update that server. It updates fine, doesn't blow up, great. Just do the exact same thing in reverse and migrate them back the other way. Um, my servers are connected at 10 gigabits, so it takes... For each server, I don't know, about seven, eight minutes to move them over live to the other machine. It's, it's really fast. When you look at the dashboard, now I don't have any of these grouped together in pools, so it shows two pools. Even one server is considered a pool. Um, and then it shows how many hosts are in there. It would be cumulative if I had more. Um, how many VMs, runner storage use. So cumulatively, I have 18 terabytes available storage um, across there for users. This is completely has a user management system. Everyone can log in at once. Everyone can work on their own VMs at the same time. Um, you can. It does have uh, more advanced ACLs and controls, so you can say, all right, you only have control of this. So from a management standpoint, it gets pretty cool because if you're running this in a larger environment, you're responsible for the this data center. Um, one of the companies and clients that we have is actually running this at four separate data centers in the U.S., and they run everything central management out of Chicago. They got it all across VPNs because it's only just sending the minimal. So now they can control that migrations take a long time if they, they can, but don't think it's a good idea to migrate them across the VPN. But from a management standpoint, one uh, Zen Orchestra instance that they have paid support for in Chicago manages their other data centers completely, all the stacks across all of there. Um, so it's really kind of slick to see this at scale, um, and it works really well from a management standpoint. Um, when you look at the individual uh, hosts, just like before, we have all the general stats, network storage, all the same features. Uh, they're all in parity on there. But we also have uh, patches that can be loaded per server. It's uh, smart enough to understand that, okay, there's updates and there's patches. Now, this is also where they've separated themselves from the way uh, Citrix has a real pain in the butt the way they do patches. And it's, I don't know, convoluted. They said, why not RPMs with their own repository? You know, this seems to be a method that works for companies. So they re-enable the RPM so you can actually do uh, yum updates from the command line to get things going. And that's essentially what this does with some of the patches and updates uh, as they come through. And it's got its own graphs and charts. Uh, the thing I will complain about, um, the choices are last 10 minutes, uh, last two hours, and last week. <laughs> yeah, they, they kind of thin on that. If you want granular reports, you really do have to use the other server or have this logging to something else that gives you more in-depth reports. Uh, looking at it too, you can look at the uh, storage health states and just the overall health of it. This is kind of neat. So let's say you were doing all this uh, shuffling around and you know something unexpected happened and uh, you end up with orphaned VDI, VDI attached to control domain or orphaned snapshots. What this happens is, let's say you were doing a live transfer. Because it never commits all the data when the live transfer failed because the power went out or whatever, you have pieces of VHDs on there. Now the good news is it never deletes them until they're fully moved so you can recover for one. I've actually, this is some of the lab testing I've done, is unplugging two servers while they're doing a uh, Zen Ocean transfer. What you do end up with is a bunch of orphaned pieces of it, and this will tell you what they are so you can clean them up. Because they will sit on the storage repository, it goes, I have part of a VDI that came from somewhere, but the transfer didn't complete, so now it's all broken. And uh, this has a nice monitoring dashboard where you can go through there. And when you do things at larger scales, once again, you can end up with a bunch of these. They're easy enough, you can look at them, do I need them, do I need a piece of them, uh, should I reattach them to something, or just delete them all. Um, when you're looking at the individual VMs running, this is the Debian 9 demo I set up, uh, you see the individual CPU usage, network throughput, memory usage, and so once again, it's very much on parity with the Windows one on there, so you can drill down and look at the performance of a single virtual machine. And here is the console in here. Uh, it runs all in HTML5, it's really slick, you have full console access there, so for some reason you uh, have some problem, you can't get into it via SSH or you can't RDP in because it's got a networking problem, you just need to click something on there, you can go in there and see the console on that machine. This actually works uh, quite well, so I can be at my house and log in through console on all my, over a VPN, because it's just, you know, HTML5, kind of like emulating it, and control a Windows machine directly like this to fix problems and things like that. We love it because we use this a lot for clients as well. It does have a, a w ability to do some copying and pasting between there as well, and send control alt delete. This is a scaling button, so you can actually scale it bigger, make it full screen, um, and have access to it. 
Now this is where Zen Orchestra departs way from the features of the uh, interface, the Windows interface. You can build custom jobs and scripting inside of here. Once again, this is where the tags come up and some of the other more advanced features. So you grab a VM, you choose the host, I chose the storage, and you, there's a ton of options. I chose VM Migrate, just for an example. You can even set a script that could say, like every, at 9 a.m., move this over to this server, and then at 9 p.m., move it back over to this server, and you can do that at scale. You could say, move all my production ones over to this, move this, move this, and then you set schedules and jobs, and you can start scripting all these. You can even say when you want to snapshot. It gets very fine grained, but it's a very powerful tool. It all runs essentially a series of cron jobs, and it just communicates with all the Zen servers that it's connected to, and orchestrates all those jobs, and can notify you if any of them failed or had an error or is a problem with them. Host install all patches. You can grab a couple of hosts, say, I want the patches, don't ask me questions, just install them every Saturday. Probably a horrible idea, but you can do that and set it up as a job and have it notify you if it failed. I generally like to load them manually on Saturdays. Now, this is the huge departure from here, is the uh, Backup NG. So Backup NG Next Generation shows a little bit more of the power of how the scripting works. So the backup tools, um, you can choose, and this is my production backup that I have. I have it disabled so it doesn't run automatically. I just choose to run it manually because, well, it's one click just to kick it off through a web interface. And then um, what you first have to do is set up the new file system remote. Now it's a little confusing maybe about how this works, but what happens is Zen Orchestra is running in a standard VM that I created on top of Zen server. So they're detached from server. You could even run it on my laptop if I want to. You can load it on a different computer and have to run it in the hypervisor, just convenient that I do. So all the data is passing through it. So it can communicate with all the Zen servers it's going to pull all the data back through them, but it needs somewhere to land it because you don't necessarily want all the backups to land inside the VM, although it gives you the option to do that. Uh, so what you want to do is you're taking this VM and attaching it to another storage repository. In our case, we just have another FreeNAS server that's not the same FreeNAS server that the pools are stored on, and it copies all the data to there. That's its landing spot that we gave it. Now the good thing is, if you are doing this on a larger scale, you can have as many as you want. And when you set these backups up, you can have it landing on many places at the same time. So instead of saying, I'm just going to back up to this box, you can say, I'm back up to all these boxes simultaneously. So you can even have multiple copies all at the same time being created as it creates the backups. Now, <clears throat> what I'm talking about right now is full backups. We're going to get into a couple other backup types, like disaster recovery protection ones and snapshots. What they look like from the FreeNAS box itself, so this is the uh, FreeNAS backup, Zen, Nexo backups, and everything in Zen server, and you're going to find this across all of it, everything is given a UUID from the network interface to the VMs to even the snapshots of VMs. Everything is then controlled from those UUIDs. And it also gives the same UUID of the VMs inside of here to control all the backups. So from a file standpoint, it just creates all these are folders at the first level, and then uh, we look again. I just cd and change directory into one of them. Here's what the backups look like from the command line. So for each one, there's our XBA file, but we don't really know what that is other than a date. But that JSON file in there has all the metadata needed to run that VM. So let's say in a total disaster, um, and this is how we protect from this, I have everything in my office goes up in smoke, and we don't have any of those backups or any of this stuff physically on site. I take all these files and I back them up literally just to an external hard drive that goes to my house. And I can then take my Zen Orchestra that runs at my house, plug it in. I say this is the storage repository. And I can restore all of my VMs exactly as they were with just some script. I just go there. Matter of fact, it does um, mass restores. You can do the same little checkbox, grab all your uh, backups, say put all these here. And it'll just, whenever it gets done, it'll get done. And you can do it just from one single external hard drive, pointed to it as a storage repository. Now, Zen does support mapping of devices uh, from the hypervisor to there. For USB devices, are pretty easy. So if you have a Zen server, you plug in a USB drive to it, you can map that into one of the VMs. So that's kind of the easy way to do it. So I copy everything to a USB drive. You plug that USB drive in at home. I map it to the VM that's running a Zen Orchestra. It has access to all the data from that point on. And this is what the JSON file looks like if you go into. Um, 
it's pretty readable, so you could parse it pretty easily if you just want to know any of the details about it um, or build your own information or scripts on top of it. There's one thing I like. Nothing's as obfuscated. It's really easy to dig into any of the details. Now, those are the full backups, and I do full backups every Saturday, but then we have the incremental backups. And you're kind of used to the concept of the incremental backups. You have your main file, and you have just all the differentials. The downside of, of having these incremental backups is I need all of them to reassemble everything because I need all the pieces to reassemble it. This is where they get kind of fancy. So the full backups on their system, they have the option of merging the data blocks back so they can do continuous replication. So instead of having to delete the last block, they can merge it all back and coalesce it back together. This is where NG gets kind of smart about that. And this is also for the full backup so it can go forward for the incrementals and do the same coalescing. And the way this works, for example, I'm going to pull it up with continuous replication. So instead of creating backups and exporting to XBA files, we can do continuous replication on the fly to as many data sets as we want. So we have our Zen pool here, we have our data set here, and we go, I want it to back up continuously, like on a schedule, let's say every hour. And it'll incrementally only send the changes to that other storage pool. And in the event something happens and the storage pool completely just dies on you, you can then flip it right over here and it's copied the whole VM over to whichever destination. It could be another server or just another storage pool. And you can just say, go ahead and start that VM. This one, something happened over here. We need to restore from an hour ago. And then you can keep as many revisions of it as you have space for. So you can say seven revisions, a hundred revisions. And then you can go back to any point in time and re-spin that VM directly from there. And this happens in the background just as an automated process. And because it's only syncing on the delta changes uh, for the continuous backup, it's only incremental. So however much data was created in that hour, it's just that small differential chain. Now what some people have done in this uh, other company, you can kind of seed it and get all the data there once. And once it's there, once if you have a remote location, you can even do this over a VPN, provided it's completely going to be based on how much data you're creating on there. Uh, but you can see how you can really easily build a nice disaster recovery solution uh, using this tool and pointing at just a couple different re repositories. Now, let's talk about, what's that? Oh. We did a data center, data center migration like that. Yeah. We did the DR copy, and then within two minutes, we shut off one server, brought up the other, and it went from one data center to another, and it, we were alive again. It's, it's wow. really neat, because you can keep, um, once you have it seated, and I know that's like one of the problems that you guys, because you guys have it constantly syncing, because if it got out of sync, it would be, right. it's a lot of data. What do you have, like 100 gig pipes? Going across uh, or no? I think we had a ten gig. Ten gig. There, yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> I do not have such connections <laughs> in my house. <laughs> um, this comes back to some of the restoring options you have on here. So when you go to do some of the restores, this will allow you to uh, choose all the list of the restores. So I do. I keep. I only keep two revisions because I do it every Saturday. So we're only two weeks back. These are my hard restores. Uh, my full disaster recovery ones. Um, but when you do the restore, it's kind of neat. They don't have to go back at all where they were. Uh, they can go back to another server. They can go back to somewhere else. Um, so you can even restore them, and but not start them. So you can just go look through the files. So I can just go, you know what, restore it, but don't put it on the same server. And it adds a date after it. So it's got like underscore uh, restore, and then the date when you restore a VM, so you know when it was restored, and that it was restored from backup, so you don't mix it up. Because it does copy all the tags and all that metadata. You don't want to go, okay, which one was real now? You want <laughs> So it does add a little bit of information to let you know that it was restored, and gives you the option to start it at the same time. Now. This is kind of cool too, because when you want to import VMs through the web interface, you can upload XVA files right to it, or OVF files right to the web interface. So in, in the same way that we can with the other one, we can create the VMs by just doing imports, and uh, it's all done through uh, the web interface. And you can choose and land them wherever they want to go, to the different storage pools and servers. Now this is where it gets really cool, because when you want to create a new VM, we have all those templates and all that, because those are built into the Zen system, but it goes a little bit further. So you can have all this and set up all your usual stuff, where the disks are, which interfaces you want to attach to the network, um, PXE, boot, or install from one of your ISOs in the ISO list. But then from a scripting standpoint, because we want to create six VMs, 
you can use uh, right here it says multiple VMs name pattern and uh, name percent is one of the options, so it'll just increment numbers after it. So if you want to spit up 30 VMs that are the same, you can start with one and have it as a template, then create 30 more just like it and have them named one through 30 or whatever naming schema you want to put in there. It's got a couple of the information mark over there, gives you a couple of variable options. And then you create a whole series of them. And you start at what the index start is at one, start, end at six, so it goes one through six. But so if you want to create another one, you can then go seven through whatever to create the next set of them. And then one of the other questions it wants to know is, you know, hey, do you want to start all these at once and why not? So you can then create them, start them, and start uh, building them together. If you tie that together, if you started with a uh, template, one of my friends, what he does is he preloads all of his templates with um, Ansible. So the first time they boot, they regenerate an SSH key on boot. As part of the template that he does. And creating a template, by the way, is super easy inside of the server. You can click on a snapshot or a VM and just say, make this VM a template. It gives you a warning that if you take a live VM and make it a template, it doesn't exist as a VM anymore because it turns it into a template. But snapshots, it just takes that snapshot and converts it into a template. So if you have one that's all set up like the way you want with things like Ansible and all the tools that you want, and you're like, okay, now I need to build 20 more of these, um, do that. I have for my testing demo, because uh, I'm testing uh, hardware, I have a template set up that's running uh, Debian 9. I have all the Pharonix test suite and everything on there. And what I do is I take my main pool of Zen servers, I build another one in my lab, build another Zen server. It takes no time at all because they don't need to have any relationship to each other. I just added a Zen orchestra and I said, go ahead and take this template and just send it across over there. Done. It creates it across over there from the template pool at the line level speed of the network. So it's really a handy tool for especially if you're doing any type of lab work. It is probably the fastest, easiest lab setups I've ever done have been with this, especially with like firewall testing and VPN testing. Um, and I use this for my YouTube channel kind of in the same way. So any YouTube video I did, I've done a lot of firewall videos on PFSense. I could do walkthroughs on how to do something. They're all done twice is kind of my secret. People are like, oh, you're concise when you do them. Like, no, they're all been done twice or more, especially every time you screwed up, you don't know about it. I go through, take a snapshot, I build out the entire tutorial, then I revert back to the snapshot, and then I turn the recorder on and do it a second time so I know exactly how to predict it's going to work. Sometimes I goof it up or I mess something up, but it's nice. I just go back with the firewall because there's so many rules when you're building firewall rules of VPN. I just hit revert back and it's like instantly back where I started at any given point. Um, also, when you're building out firewalls, it's nice to have a template of those. So I've got templates for PFSense, templates for uh, Debian, templates for anything that I've been testing with or showing off on my YouTube channel. Because uh, once you build them, that way I can start with, because I don't want to have to reload it every time. So it's loaded, I know what the username is, I know what the password is, I have a couple network interfaces assigned to like those general things, and then you build it out, and then you can just duplicate them as many times as you want here. So that's it for the event. Do you have questions or want to see more about it, uh, live demos or anything? Or I know one of the things that, um, it seemed like Zen was really susceptible to some of the processor issues with Spectre and whatnot. Um, I, th I thought there was something about that, where it, it was able to read processes outside of its own. No more than any of the other hypervisors. Okay. Uh, to my knowledge, there was nothing about Zen that made it any more or less susceptible um, to that because once with the Spectre meltdown, especially with this latest uh, hyper-threading one, the latest one I found, I can't remember the name of it, yeah. um, they're all the same problem. Is once something's in the same channel, especially in specifically in the hyper-threaded ones, if a process is running on there, they've been proving, and there's a fix for OpenSSL that was able to get this out, um, they were able to pull if a SSL is running on one physical processor, the adjacent processor, um, they were able to read the memory out of there and pull SSL keys out, for example. And of course, this scales out with hypervisor, and especially you know companies like Amazon running uh, this at their core. We really don't want adjacent processes being able to see what's going on. Um, a lot of the mitigations come through uh, as a flushing the cache option by. Uh, flushing the cache out was able to get rid of a lot of it. The other side that was able to mitigate it, um, I know in OpenSSL, they changed and added a couple of randomness in OpenSSL so you can't just predict it in the same way. I didn't look at the exact errata how they changed it, but I thought it was interesting that they patched the OpenSSL piece, but it's undoubtedly added some type of timing in there. But to my knowledge, there's no, Zen's not any more or less susceptible to um, that piece of it. So, more of a chicken and egg problem. I saw at the beginning there you were talking about installing. Yeah. Use curl. I need a proxy to get to get through the proxy. 
So is there a way of setting the proxy to do the curl, or would I have to use a different method? Probably have to use a different method. I mean, you could, um, if you knew how to get the proxy information into from the command line. I've never tried pulling curl through a proxy, but I don't. I think for the curl support, I don't remember how to do it. We have to give it the actual proxy. Like with Ford, they have a J, uh, JavaScript file. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So if you just set up the yeah. proxy manually, then you're, you're good. You should be, yeah. Well, another option um, is, too, you can just, when you're outside the network, co copy it down to a thumb drive. I think it's like a couple hundred megs. So okay. you can just grab that XBA file right. and then uh, use SCP and just SCP it right over to there. Because you can SSH right into the box for all the command line stuff. Second question. Uh, authentication, authorization, and tenants. You set up users, give them access to some things and not others? Yeah. Yeah, through the, um, it does have user permissions. So you can, I've never dug real deep to just how fine grain it'll go, but I believe it supports um, Active Directory as well with Zen Orchestra. So then you can tie it back into theirs. I know they have a whole ACL and permissions on there. Um, because all of my users uh, at my office, we have four of us that manage our Zen server stack, um, we all have the same level of permissions because there's not anything that's restricted from one person or the other. Are you restricted to the kernel that's on the host system and all of those, or is it is it pretty much pretty well segregated off there? Yeah, it's segregated. So it starts with DOM zero. So there's your main Zen server okay. kernel that's running, um, and because it does full hardware virtualization, each one is 100% dependent. Okay. So the Windows servers um, there. If you're doing para virtualization on there and you load some of there, there's a more interaction with it, but there's still a very secure, very segmented on there. It's just a little bit lighter weight. Isn't that like the difference between containering containers right. and, yes. and virtualizing? Where virtualizing you have a separate kernel running. Right. Where containers you're using the host kernel. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you that. load this up with Core OS, then Core OS becomes the container part. Core OS plus Docker, and then all the containers would be below that. So then you're doing container management, but technically you're only doing container management inside of a VM that is one being managed over there. Right. Um, but I, the people have said they've gotten that working at scale. Um, like I said, I'm just not an expert when it comes to like the Docker side of it and the container side of it. So with, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. With, with the Windows uh, images as well, does it download those directly? No, or you just got to use, uh, yeah, you still got to grab the ISO for them. Okay. Um, but it doesn't, uh, I've actually had great luck with Windows 10. Uh, oddly enough, Windows 10 doesn't seem to care when it moves hardware. It just wants to reactivate because really? it recognizes a hardware change. Wow. But from a, window, in Server 2016, it's kind of the same thing. Other than the reactivation, we've migrated, uh, we just migrated someone off of uh, ESXi. And well, they had 2012 servers, and they had an old ESXi server, and we used the Clonezilla, and we just <laughs> dropped them all onto uh, their shiny new Zen server, and it worked great. Uh, okay. It solved a lot of problems for them. And it, it works rather well. The uh, other Windows versions, Windows 7 can be finicky. Windows XP is awful on it. It just, yeah. you gotta you got to play. There's a there's a tool actually by Citrix that um, I think is called P2B. Uh, it's a conversion tool that's pretty in-depth. It's free, and you load it. And the idea is it, it preps a Windows hardware machine for being moved onto a Citrix server. Or not Citrix, but a uh, VMware server. But because it just changes to a virtualization driver and strips out the uh, the syskeys related to um, hardware, once you prep it, you can send it to somewhere else like Citrix server or a XCPNG server. So it can work on Zen, it can work on um, other ones on there. So that tool is actually great for older versions because you have some legacy thing that has to run in Windows XP, but you know, virtualize it, stick it in uh, one of these, and life's a lot better. So it's not crapping itself because it can't figure out that it doesn't, you know, that the hard drive changed or some other thing like or that. Or the hard drive died. Yeah. Because it stays on old hard drive, hardware. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a, um, one of the clients, we've run a few of them. They're, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a really popular uh, transportation software, and we have a lot of trucking clients. They We have a virtual machines that, a series of them that run Windows 7. This is so stupid. There's a tool that runs and a RDP into it, each one of the dispatchers, because uh, it has to stay running all the time for the back and forth communication with the truck. And it talks to the server 2012. So you don't want to load it on everyone's workstation because it's a pain in the butt to load. Yeah. So we set it up as an RDP on there. And there's a big license fee for each workstation. There's only a couple of people that need to communicate with it. So we have a whole series of seven VMs all sitting there running the same stupid program so they can uh, communicate with the drivers. It's, yeah, but it does work rather well. <laughs> Any other questions? How does the ARM side of the house look? I know a lot of, a lot of this was x86 and stuff, but um, 
I know that Zinn used, used to work on ours. Yeah, they're, um, to my knowledge, they're one of the only hypervisors that have uh, scale support for ARM. Um, it's kind of interesting, they have it, it still seems to be being developed, but yeah, there's not there's not much fanfare for it, oddly enough. Um, kind of semi-off topic, but related, was AMD announced their new ROM processors, um, so you want to get into a data center, and uh, when I was listening to an interview with them, they talked about the same thing, they said, we did all this ARM stuff, and nobody got excited. When they tried to have an ARM announcement, when they had done stuff, they couldn't stop getting questions about their x86 and x64 line. And he said, you know, we always thought, like a lot of people at the high levels at these processor companies thought ARM was the solution to talk about building ARM data centers. It's like, I think it was excited from people at the top, but somehow the people at the bottom were like, yeah, that, that's cool, Let's, well, where's your x86? Where's the faster, more core stuff? So. It's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be interesting to watch the development of this project as well, because with the license fees and everything else from ESX, uh, we've talked to a lot of companies uh, through my YouTube channel. What they do is they reach out to us and they go, "Well, let's talk about a migration. These license fees are coming up again. We have to get a new version. This is a big cost. Even if they go for the paid pro support with these guys, it's still less money. And their support packages are." Not cheap. I mean, they have, I forget the exact cost on this, but uh, like the Zen Orchestra, the full support is like $400 a month uh, for the support for the product. It's yeah. like they have for their top tier support. But they still said that's still cheaper than what we pay ESXi. Um, so they look at it to these large corporate. And uh, Oliver Lambert, one of the head developers, uh, friends with him, um, they are. They said, we're doing really well. That's what he, he says when it comes to it. Matter of fact, when I was doing testing, he says, you know, I'll mail you an Optine if you want to do some testing with it and stuff like that. Like, he's like, we have all kinds of stuff if you want. I'm like, I might take you up on that to do some of the speed <laughs> tests. Uh, they said business has been really, really good for them. This project has been, like I said, just seeing how much they got overfunded on a Kickstarter, just stating that we're gonna write an open source thing and give it away, and they got $37,000 thrown at them. They're like, oh yeah, I guess this is popular. How is the migration from ESX and the emotion to uh, pretty pain free. Uh, the all the machines that we've done, the the only problem I've run into is uh, people who do dumb things with setup of ESXi. You know, this is a problem. There's this is a known bug in the older versions. The max hard drive size is two terabyte when you do allocations. So by doing a two terabyte allocation, uh, VMware kind of craps out when you try to export, back up, or move it because it's at the absolute max size. The max size is 78 megabytes smaller on Zen because of some overhead with the QEMU emulation of the hard drive. That is difficult to Windows because it sees a hard drive slightly smaller, so you have to do some manipulation with the partitions. You can't do a direct clone. You have to first downsize the partition, which doesn't downsize ES6I's allocation, so you still can't export it to an OBF file. You then have to go and find some clone tools. Uh, we've used Markham Reflect and Aomi, um, our two popular tools that work well with Windows, because they'll do the partition conversion with GPT and MBR uh, to get the migration going. So it's basically using cloning software because uh, there's not, like I said, a direct path. But once it's in the Zen server world, um, just uninstall the uh, Zen, the VMware drivers, and away you go. And it will boot with VMware drivers in there. It doesn't crash anything. It just, just they just give errors because it, it's in a different hypervisor. So um, you're comparing with VMware, and I love that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also looking at OpenStack. I don't know if you have any experience or any interest in that. How would you compare this to an OpenStack? OpenStack's a lot different. I'm not an expert on it. Um, I do know after uh, doing research, um, I was hoping he was going to come here tonight because he should present sometime. Uh, Jay LaCroix, I don't know if you know him from, uh, Tony knows him real well. He also co-hosts our podcast. Yeah, he's wrote um, a couple good books on Ubuntu Server, and they were really evaluating OpenStack, and he actually decided um, on this. He's actually also used Proxmox, which is another uh, good open source one out there. OpenBZ. Yeah. That one too. I'm not as familiar with OpenStack, but I do know um, OpenStack from anyone I've talked to. They generally say it just has a really high learning curve. Like it's just not easy to learn. Uh, so that, of course, created a challenge for his tech team going, this is just more than we want to take on. Like we spent, a few of us have spent hours trying to figure out just how to get some of the networking functions uh, to work. Now, that's the, them telling me I don't have any direct experience with it. Um, but he did say comparative because he loaded this watching one of my YouTube videos and goes, that was it? Like, it, it's deployed, it's easy, I'm creating VMs and moving them around. He goes, this is almost like a no-brainer. And it's as simple as I, you know, I kind of ran through it fast, but it really is just incredibly easy to load and get this up and running. The ease of use is something um, 
that I really kind of like. Once you kind of get your head around the networking, because that does confuse some people, how you have the physical interfaces, but they actually, the networking works the same. Now, something I'm a little bit less clear on, because uh, they stripped some of this out, there was a, um, it's called Open vSwitch, and Open vSwitch allows you to take multiple uh, servers, load Open vSwitch on there, and have a virtual switch that extends between uh, different Zen hosts, but they've been reworking it because there's a bunch of pieces of that that were closed source, so they're working on revamping some of that, but it looks like Open vSwitch, if you do a little tinkering, you can make it work in there, because uh, there's workarounds for any of the open source stuff that, um, that didn't exist to create it in there. But that allows you like full switch management inside of it, so it creates like, an extra layer where you have uh, VLAN management inside of a separate switch that also does uh, QoS, traffic shaping, all your standard higher end um, switching features in a virtual switch before it gets to the network interfaces. Uh, my solution for that, it, like the way we run most of the clients, is we just put managed switches in and tying them over there. Um, it also does support, I didn't mention this, um, they added overt support, um, over, uh, no, S SROB, I'm sorry, not overt, SROB. And what SROB is, if you have certain uh, network interface cards, they can be virtualized at the hardware level. So it's a virtualization of the network stack so that they can have not like a PCI pass-through where you're passing through the device. It can multiple virtualize a physical interface and pass it through. So um, Chelsea supports this on their new 5 series cards, the 10 gigabit and fiber cards. So let's say you have a fiber cable SAN card. You can pass it through to like a Windows running inside of there, also with another machine passing through, and they would share that piece of hardware. Um, that's a pretty cool feature. It's kind of advanced, but it's also kind of neat because you only want to build the Windows VM at a certain size, and then inside of that, you want Windows to have this massive storage pool via some type of SAN. Well, you pass the SAN through directly as opposed to bringing it through the hypervisor um, for the storage pools. And then being able to support the SROV means you can get 40 gigabit access pretty easily or bond it together. And it does, and uh, you didn't notice, there is a bond option on there. You can lag together interface, uh, interfaces, bond interfaces, those are all supported in there. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So before you head on over to Buddy's,